But first, the Prime Minister is visiting Brussels tomorrow to try and hold talks with the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. And ahead of the trip, we're joined from Cambridgeshire by the Brexit Secretary, Stephen Barclay. Thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm looking forward to hopefully getting some guidance on whether or not we're any closer to a Brexit deal. But before that, I just want to start with some of the revelations we've seen from David Cameron's book and specifically uh, the charge that he's laid at Boris Johnson, uh, which is that his concerns about sovereignty were secondary to another concern for Boris. What was the best outcome for him? The conclusion I'm left with is he risked an outcome he didn't believe in because it would help his political career. Does Boris Johnson really believe in Brexit? He does. He led the campaign. And you'll recall, Sophie, at the time, the Remain side was expected to win. So the more prudent thing, if it, someone was looking purely at their career, would have been to back uh, Remain, as I remember myself, because I backed Leave as the only member of the Whip's office to do so. And uh, Remain would have been the easier career choice. So uh, Boris Johnson led the campaign. He did so because he believes in Brexit and he's committed to delivering it. Uh, and I think the main thing, really, with the David Cameron books will be to look at uh, the job that he and David, uh, he and and George Osborne did in terms of repairing the economy. I think that was the key achievement uh, of those years. Uh, but in terms of the uh, Brexit, uh, the Prime Minister was committed to leave. You're talking there about how David Cameron will be remembered. Um, do you think people will look back on his time in office fondly? I do. I think uh, you've got to remember the situation we found in 2010. Uh, the government was borrowing one pound in every four under Labour. They'd crushed the economy. Uh, of course, it's nothing compared to what uh, Jeremy Corbyn would do uh, if he was put in charge of the economy now. Uh, but we inherited an economy in appalling shape. And what uh, David Cameron did was repair that economy and actually uh, pave the way for the very positive uh, spending review that uh, the current Chancellor, Sajid Javid, was able to do, which has and that enabled us to put the extra 20,000 police on the street, to put a record investment, 34 billion, into our NHS, to give teachers the biggest increase in their starting salary, an increase of £6,000. And David Cameron and George Osborne really paved the way for that by taking many other tough decisions in 2010. You say they've paved the way for it. It sounds a bit like you're just ripping up any fiscal responsibility that the Conservative Party was once known for. No, we, we took the tough decisions. We were borrowing £1 in four under Labour. Uh, everyone will remember the 2008 crash, uh, the damage that was caused to our economy, Which the bailout the crash, I of the say, banks by a Labour government. government. Yeah, but it was exaggerated by the, uh, the excessive spending in the run-up to it uh, and the fact that we were borrowing beyond our means. So, so David Cameron and George Osborne deserve credit for the measures they took. Uh, but it's right, having taken those decisions, we're now in a position to invest in our public services and to level up. And you saw that with the Prime Minister's announcements in terms of transport schemes in the north of England. We're keen to level up in all parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and actually, as a result of the stewardship of the economy, we're now in a position to get that extra spending, for example, the extra 20,000 police officers, which my constituents and many others want to see. OK, well, let's talk about Brexit, shall we? Uh, Boris Johnson's given an interview in today's Mail on Sunday where he portrays the UK as like the incredible Hulk. The madder Hulk gets, the stronger Hulk gets. <laughs> effectively saying that if there is a, a breakdown in the negotiation, if he can't get a deal, he's just going to leave at the end of October anyway. So does Boris Johnson just think that rules are something for other people to follow, as Parliament, of course, has passed a law saying he needs to ask for an extension in that case? Well, the Hulk was a winner, as you know, Sophie, and was very, extremely popular. And I'd uh, rather be backing uh, a character and a leader who's the Hulk than one who's on the chicken run, as uh, Jeremy Corbyn is. I mean, the fact is that the Prime Minister is committed to delivering Brexit. It is what uh, people voted for. We're now three years on from that referendum. Uh, and my constituents here in Cambridgeshire, uh, like many across the country, want to see Brexit done. They want to see us get it done and actually move on to the domestic agenda uh, through the Queen's speech. So it's important we get Brexit over the line. It's best to do it with a deal, uh, but it's important whether it's with a deal or without a deal, we actually get this done. Well, let's talk about the chances of getting a deal, shall we? Because this really is the important issue uh, of today, you know, putting aside the kind of destructions of the Incredible Hulk. Is progress really being made on getting a deal? 
It is. I mean, there's been detailed technical talks led by uh, David Frost, the Prime Minister's Europe advisor. There will be meeting Michel Barnier's team. The Prime Minister will be seeing President Juncker uh, tomorrow. I'll be meeting with Michel Barnier tomorrow. Uh, so there's extensive talks being happening both at a technical level but also at a political level. Uh, the Prime Minister was with the Taoiseach uh, on Monday. I was in Poland on Thursday, Friday. So there's been a huge amount of uh, work going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we can see a landing zone in terms of a future deal, uh, but there is significant work still to do. So the talks tomorrow will be an important step forward as part of that, and they build on significant discussion that's been happening at a technical level. What is the landing zone then? Let's get specific. What is the landing zone that you see? Well, I think there's two aspects to that landing zone. Firstly, in terms of the withdrawal agreement, it's the fact that the backstop needs to go. Uh, we've been very clear with the EU about that. Parliament has rejected it three times. It would involve people in Northern Ireland taking laws over which they'd have no vote. Uh, and therefore, the backstop has to go from the withdrawal agreement. And indeed, EU leaders themselves have said that they're open to being creative and flexible uh, in terms of future arrangements. Then in terms of the political declaration, uh, we've addressed one of the key questions from the EU, which is what sort of future relationship is the UK seeking? Uh, we're very clear we want a best-in-class free trade agreement. Uh, certain issues then flow in terms of changes to the political declaration uh, as a result of that. So we've been having those technical uh, discussions, uh, discussing also with Northern Ireland leaders, which the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland uh, and others have been uh, doing. So a huge amount has been happening behind the scenes. We're very clear what it is we need in order to get a deal through Parliament. Uh, and those are the discussions that we've been having. I just want to pick up on something that you just said in that answer uh, about Northern Ireland. The backstop, of course, is at the centre of all this. Uh, you were saying that the backstop is unacceptable because it would mean Northern Ireland accepting laws on which they have no vote. Is that the issue here? If Northern Ireland had a say, or consented, if you like, uh, to uh, some of the changes, could you see a backstop where there was some divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK? Well, I think it's also part of that. Consent is important, of course, Sophie, but part of that is also the interplay with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. We as a government are absolutely committed to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Sometimes that's presented by the EU as simply an Irish issue. It's a shared issue. Both the Irish government and the UK government are absolutely committed to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And you will know that a key part of that was the need for consent from both communities within Northern Ireland. Uh, and sometimes it's said that it's simply the DUP that have a concern with the backstop. That's not correct. Uh, there's other leading uh, and much respected figures, people like no, uh, the Nobel Prize winner Lord Trimble, who have expressed concern. Lord Bew, uh, one of the key architects of the Belfast Agreement, have expressed concern with the backstop. So it is important we move forward with the consent of both sides of the community in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that is a key aspect of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement itself. So that's very much part of the thinking and part of the consultations that we're having. So, um, I know it, it sounds quite technical, but I kind of feel that this is really the important part to get to the grips with where we are in the talks. Are you saying that there aren't red lines on divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK if there is that crucial consent element then? What the Prime Minister has been absolutely clear on, and you will have heard him say it many times, is the UK will leave uh, as a whole. Uh, we will ensure that the sovereignty of the UK is protected. Uh, but it's also in important that uh, we reflect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And one of the key concerns with the backstop is the fact that it is not consistent uh, in the view of many within uh, Northern Ireland with uh, the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So that's part of the discussions. Now, at a very detailed level, of course, there are already areas such as on uh, animal and plant health where there is an all Ireland uh, approach. So there are issues within Ireland already that are part uh, of the agreement uh, already. Uh, within uh, the way the all, all of Ireland uh, economy operates. Uh, and we can get into those details uh, as part of the talks. Uh, but that is different from the principle of the backstop, and the backstop needs to go. If you manage to bring back a deal, will any Conservative MP who votes against it have the whip withdrawn? Well, I mean, uh, issues of whipping are, are for the chief whip. Uh, you know, I've got enough to focus on in terms of the negotiations, and, and that is what I will focus on. So I leave well, issues be fair, of, uh, it, if, of whipping uh, for the chief whip. But I think... If they were, if it wasn't... Well, I, I think the key issue is, is 
I think the key issue is when I listen to business leaders, when I listen to constituents, what I, the clear message I get is people want this done. They want Brexit done, they want to get on to the agenda, the 20,000 extra for the police, the record investment in the NHS, the increase in uh, starting salaries for teachers. That's what they want this government to get on and they want Brexit done. And I think many Conservative MPs share that desire. They want to see Brexit delivered. They recognise that that's best done with a deal, a deal that delivers the implementation period, that gives business the confidence to invest. We're already uh, at a stage where we have record inward investment, the highest level of inward investment uh, within Europe, the third highest in the, uh, the world. So the economy is strong, employment is high, unemployment's at a, a record low, uh, and a deal will allow businesses then to kick on uh, and to have further investment. So I think Conservative MPs, and indeed MPs across the Commons say they want a deal. Uh, we think we can get a deal, but it has to be one that addresses the central concern, and that is the backstop. I'm keen to talk about the implication of no deal. You were saying there that the best way to leave is with a deal, and we've seen, of course, Operation Yellowhammer documents uh, published, the government's reasonable worst-case planning scenarios for leaving the EU without an agreement. Um, just to run through some of it, it said there's going to be major delays at ports, uh, fresh food supplies could be hit, prices could rise, medicines could be particularly vulnerable to severe extended delays. Is that a price worth paying for leaving on the 31st of October? I don't for a minute think that's what's happened, uh, will happen. I mean, we're uh, preparing for a worse scenario, but putting measures to ensure that does not happen. And let me just give you an example from Friday. I was discussing in Poland uh, with their haulage industry and also with their poultry set, uh, industry. 84,000 Polish jobs in poultry. They were saying they don't want to see any delays if you have fresh poultry coming uh, across. Uh, any delay to that uh, risks losing that. Uh, there's 1,200 Polish lorries on our road. So, so the EU countries don't want to see delays at Calais. Uh, the Irish government, 40% uh, of their exports go through Dover, two-thirds of their own medicines come through Great Britain. They don't want to see uh, delays either. So there's a common interest across Europe. It's not just the UK that wants to ensure that there's the flow of goods through at the short straits. It's also EU countries, whether that's the, uh, the truckers, the, uh, the poultry businesses in Poland, or whether it's uh, uh, the supermarkets in Ireland. So there's a common interest there. We're taking a huge amount of work uh, doing a huge amount of work to ensure we've got the right preparation in place. Michael Gove uh, is leading on that uh, within government with daily meetings to ensure that we're ready for that. Uh, but it's prudent we prepare and that's exactly what we're doing. You say that no one wants it, but just because nobody wants something to happen doesn't mean that something won't happen, does it? And these are the government's own worst case no, scenarios no, but, but that we're look looking at. The stats. at. Sorry, if, if, let, just, to let me, no, no. just to let me finish the question. Um, one, one of the warning uh, in Yellowhammer is about medicines. Now, a lot of our viewers will be really, really concerned that they may not be able to get the medicines that they need if there is a no-deal Brexit. Can you guarantee that everyone will get the medicine they need if we leave without a deal? Well, irrespective of Brexit, there are, at any one time, the Department of Health will tell you, up to around 50 medical lines where there are disruptions just as part of the normal run of business. I mean, you may recall covering, uh, I'm sure, on the programme a couple of weeks ago in terms of HRT. So the, the, at any one point, there is uh, disruption to supplies. The question, I think, you're saying is, within Brexit, is there going to be further disruption? And that is why we put a framework in place for extra capacity. We've got air freight capacity as well for anything that's urgent. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies have been working on this for several years in terms of additional stock. They themselves have put in place uh, additional flow capacity as well. So there's a huge amount of work uh, being done on this. But again, this is something that is a shared interest. It's in the EU's interest to keep the flow, not just in terms of uh, medical goods uh, into the UK and onto Ireland, but also in terms of medical goods from the UK on which many within Europe themselves rely. So it's right we prepare for this. We're meeting daily, we're engaging with the pharmaceutical companies, but we've been working on this for two, three years. We've got over 300 work streams across Whitehall preparing for this. Uh, so a huge amount of work has been done, uh, and this is something that happens in any event as part of business as usual within the Department of Health. And just finally, um, we've got the Supreme Court battle uh, next week on whether or not it was lawful for the Prime Minister to suspend Parliament. What reason did the Prime Minister give to the Queen for proroguing Parliament? <laughs> 
I think, I think, think you know that conversations between a Prime Minister and a Queen are, are a private matter. They're not an issue that are shared uh, with the Cabinet. So, uh, of course, the, the court in England took a different view to the court uh, in Scotland. We respect uh, the decision of the court. It's right that this matter now goes to the UK, UK Supreme Court and the government will abide by the decision of the UK Supreme Court. I mean, that is the, the normal flow of these things and that's uh, absolutely proper.